So I think GERD is a very interesting disease state because even though you know we think of it as a simplistic disease, it's actually very heterogeneous. If you think about all the symptoms or complications that GERD can cause, it would be illogical to think that one treatment would fix everything. And that's where I think we get into this problem where if you're a gastroenterologist, you think PPIs are gonna fix everything, but we know the data suggests that it's not a very effective treatment for regurgitation, cough, things where movement of the gastric juice goes all the way up into the oral pharynx. So you may get the acid taste better with PPIs, but you're not gonna treat the regurgitation. So I think the regurgitant population is a much more refractory patient population than say esophagitis and heartburn, because it's really a manifestation of anatomy and a little bit of physiology. So in order to treat regurgitation, you have to fix the anatomy. You literally have to repair the hernia and bolster up the anti-reflux barrier. And I think the gastroenterologists now are starting to appreciate that. We're seeing all these people fail PPIs, they're coming in with regurgitation, and we know that if we increase the PPI, it just doesn't work. So we have to fix the anatomy, and I think that's really where you know, sending someone for magnetic sphincter augmentation or links has been a really great approach. So we know that the regurgitant uh, patient population doesn't respond to PPIs very well. So what the Caliber randomized controlled trial did was it actually compared links in these refractory regurgitant patients who were on a PPI, and it actually compared them to an escalation of PPI. But now in a very well-constructed randomized trial, we were able to show that the LYNX was profoundly better in terms of symptom control, physiologic normalization, um, acid exposure. It just dominated double-dose PPI. If you're not treating the anatomy, you're not doing a full job for your patient. You're leaving them hanging, essentially, because you may be thinking you're treating them appropriately, but the fact of the matter is, this is an anatomical and a physiologic problem, and you need an anatomical and physiologic fix. Don't just increase their PPI and expect them to get better. You gotta fix the anatomy, and that's really what this showed. Good morning, my name is Vimal. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so uh, I think we will start our benign upper GI session uh, with the first speaker, who's uh, Dr. Ruben Wong from uh, NUS uh, Singapore. He's a gastroenterologist and he will talk about the preoperative uh, diagnostic workup for anti reflux surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vimal. Uh, can you hear me? Just want to do a quick sound check. Am I coming through yeah. clearly? Okay, great. Yeah. Now, first of all, good morning to all of you. And within 30 minutes, I'm going to package in an entire talk on esophageal testing before anti-reflux surgery. I'm a gastroenterologist, and it was nice to actually see a friend, John Pandolfino, on the preamble video just now about the links. Now, what I'm going to be touching on today, uh, these are my disclosures, and the one of relevance, uh, number one, my involvement in the Chicago Esophageal Manometry Com Revision Committee, and number two, I also sit on the SAGES Poems Gu Guideline Committee, amongst other things, but these are the two relevant ones for this talk. The score for my talk is going to focus on two things. Number one, the two aspects of testing, which I feel are necessary before you actually put knife to skin. Is there really reflux? If my patient has no esophagitis on an endoscopy, is there non-erosive reflux occurring? And what is the criteria for that? Number two, is it safe to go to head with surgery? Do I need to interrogate the esophagus for function before operation? And how to avoid post-surgery dysphagia? And of course, a visit to the lawyers as well. Now, to understand that, we roughly need a gestalt as to why does reflux happen? And I wouldn't go to this slide because all of us here are experts in this, including the audience. But suffice to say that TLESRs or transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations, plus a bunch of other factors play into why reflux occurs. And we need to address this to actually stop the reflux as compared to what John is saying, give a PPI or PCAP and reduce the acidity. Our patients will often come to us not saying, hey, I've got reflux, but they will come to us with symptoms and as we're all familiar with the Montreux classification, the symptoms are either esophageal, which classically we actually can see reflux esophagitis barrets, and it's really clear cut. 
But on the right side, you have to bear in mind that there are patients with extra esophageal symptoms, sinusitis, pharyngitis, and you may be even asked to do a fundoplication for a patient with reflux asthma. Think carefully before you do that, because these are potential areas where it is a lot more gray. Um, I like this slide, once again, from John, as well as Peter Carillas' group just published last year, where they described different reflux phenotypes published in clinical gastrohepatology. And really, the one which we want to address here um, as gastroenterologists who are interested in surgery and surgeons are those patients who really have a motor function issue, for example, hiatus hernia, and who have obvious reflux, which means they have got esophagitis, they have Barrett's, and they have got evidence on a pH or pH impedance study of reflux. The last patient you want to do a wrap upon or any form of augmentation are those who have esophageal hypersensitivity of functional. Now, how do you diagnose reflux? First off, this is well known to all of us. We pop a scope in, and if we actually see significant esophagitis, a grade C or a grade D, okay, then it is fairly obvious that there's definitely something that's coming up and damaging the light lining of the esophagus. If you see Barrett's esophagus, that is good evidence as well. And always remember let's say Barrett's is present, short segment. I would encourage all of you to classify it. Okay. And but the truth of the matter is um, in Asia, esophagitis, if it occurs, tends to be mild. And this is a study which we did a number of years ago, in which we looked at patients coming to us with reflux symptoms. And lo and behold, the bulk of them had grade A esophagitis, a few of them had grade B, and one fifth of them had no esophagitis at all. Which then begs the question, if you have sent a patient for a gastroscopy, what is it likely to show? And this is from the Asian GERD consensus. The majority of patients, as agreed by the expert panel, would have very mild esophagitis and that non-erosive reflux disease remains the commonest manifestation of reflux in the Asia Pacific region. That's not very helpful because what it tells you is that if you're gonna put a scope in, you will have patients with reflux with no esophagitis. Diagnosis of it is really number one, if you have a patient of classic symptoms, you can try a trial of therapy and endoscopy with a red flag so they're not responsive. But if there's no esophagitis, can we prove that indeed there is reflux and that reflux is the underlying problem? And so this is where we get into reflux testing. So at this stage, you would have done an endoscopy or the patient has been referred to you one done in which you found really mild possibly Los Angeles grade A, or no evidence of reflux, and the patient is adamant, and the referring physician says there's definitely reflux occurring. What can you do? First of all, there are various ways of testing. Um, in the past, we looked for esophagitis and damage, as mentioned in the past. But if there isn't, in the present, we can now try and see reflux real time. A few devices that are available. There's the rest tag device. Some of you out there are probably familiar with this, where there's a little probe that hangs at the back of the pharynx and, just, and actually picks up aerosolized acid. And so you're looking for multiple pH. Really ready for prime time. My humble thoughts about it are, I think, values for what is described as abnormal need to be described properly. Um, the correlation between um, a proper pH impedance study and REST has been done, but there's some conflicting evidence. And so I would conclude that it has promise, but you probably need further validation before you take this forward. Another thing which has come up very much of interest is the PEP test. The idea is to actually detect, detect the presence of pepsin in the saliva, presumably due to gastroesophageal reflux. Um, that has some degree of validity, but once again, it's a single point test, although it's non-invasive and it's administered by the patient. Uh, my humble take on it, a good device to use, but it probably needs a little bit more work in actually getting complete validation. And so we come to what is the cornerstone of uh, 
continual ambulatory reflux testing, and that is a 24-hour pH or 24-hour pH impedance test. You could do this in a wired form, and this is the old Medtronic DigiTrapper device, or you could do it wirelessly, Bravo capsule, where you actually put and fire this little radio frequency capsule above the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, the issue with this, the Bravo is that it gives you great recording after 72 hours. Very important to remember. So a single point pH. And what you get, and this is with the DigiTrap in one of our patients, you actually get a multiple drops in acidity that actually occur in the lower esophagus in the patient who's acid suppressed. And we then do a correlation to find out whether there's a symptom reflux association. But I think what has really come to the fore is the use of impedance. And I think this has made a big difference, especially for your patients who have purported extra esophageal symptoms. And what happened to has got multiple impedance channels going up the catheter. This is one of our patients at a workshop which we conduct. So we run this workshop. GI motility for the past 10 years where we actually do hands-on training for uh, reflux as well as uh, esophageal motility and interactive motility testing. And what you can see here, those squiggly lines and colors are impedance catheters from proximal to distal. And that orange line right at the bottom is pH. So you can see there is a retrograde event which actually occurs, something goes up and there's barely a drop in pH. So this is a weakly acidic uh, reflux in the multiple channels, it like the external reflux. So in that diagram and snapshot on the left, you can see that there is reflux, but it doesn't go all the way up. On the tracing on the right, you can see there's reflux that goes all the way up. And hang on a moment, there's a little hump in the center of the tracing, and that is a gas event which occurs. There is a gastric belt which occurs as well. And at the end of the day, this is what you this is a tracing from one of my patients. You actually get impedance, the orange, and what we are seeing here is what events occur, and you then do a correlation accordingly. We're in a retrograde fashion, and also a drop in pH accordingly. And the question you really want to answer is how much reflux is there? whether it be acid exposure time, demesis, or number of impedance events. And importantly, you want to be able to classify your patients into one of these four quadrants. Ideally, the patients who should be going for surgery are those on the right side. That means they have GERD, that means they have excessive reflux and a positive symptom reflux association, or those who do not have an association but have clear-cut excessive reflux events. The patients you do not want to intervene in surgically will be those on the left, those who have a function sensitive esophagus. And so if you look at the Porto or the Leon consensus, what you should be able to answer at the end of all the studies done, it does your patient have reflux, that box up there in red and orange. If there's esophagitis on acid exposure time that's excessive, there you go. There's evidence of it. If there isn't, it'll be the line right at the bottom in blue, whereby you don't really see anything that's occurring. And so based on that, you can make decisions. Now, this is important because the bulk of refractory refluxes do not have GERD. And so uh, on that score, I want to encourage all of you to think about it carefully to stratify your patients whether they have reflux or not. And if they definitely have, then these are candidates who if they fail acid suppression and conventional measures are potential consideration for surgical intervention. Now, very quickly, in manometry, so we're putting a catheter in to measure the pressures in the esophagus. And we have moved on from traditional manometry to now what are known as Klaus contour plots, which are actually pressure represented in color. And we actually translate all the previous squiggly lines into color now. And this is what we see. When you correlate it with a fluoroscopic study, you can see this is a normal peristaltic swallow initially, which then tapers and slows down subsequently as you go along. Okay, And the lower esophageal sphincter opens up. 
the two big questions we want to answer and of relevance to this talk are, is the door opening and closing? That is the lower esophageal sphincter, number one. Number two, is the pump working conceptually? Are your esophageal contractions normal? And this is important and I'll come to it in very quickly in a short while. First of all, whether the door is opening or not, with patient pressure. And it also allows us at the same time when we do a manometry to look at the EG junction morphology, where we can see whether there is a dehiscence between the crude diaphragm and the lower esophageal sphincter that results in a high hernia. And we can then, as per the Chicago classification, subtype the hydro hernia. Okay, there are potentially some changes coming up, uh, but we won't discuss them today because it's not been published yet. Importantly, you want to tell what's the strength of the contraction. So in this picture on the right side, left side, you can see there's hardly any pressure going on, okay, with a very low contractile integral. On the right side, you've got a vision, okay. You want to see the pattern of contraction. In this case, you can see it's a spasm on the left as versus a contraction which is weak with a break on the right. And you want to look at the intra-bolus pressure. Is there panesophageal pressurization? Is the bolus going down properly? Why all this is important is because it then allows you to classify your patients as per the Chicago classification. You need to wind up. Yep, okay, one more minute. And what you want to do is you do not want to wrap your patients who have an underlying esophageal major dysmotility. And so where we are right now is that we are at this point whereby we want to be able to classify our patients accurately. And I want to end off with this final anecdote. A patient who comes for reflux was then referred on for reflux surgery. But before that, she came for a reflux study. This is the reflux study, last three slides. And it is marked and remarkable. Look at this for a paucity of impedance events. There's hardly any anti-grade events occurring and neither is any, any reflux. And when we did the manometry, this is what we saw. This is type 2 achalasia. And look at the lower esophageal sphincter, very, very tense. So if we had sent this patient for surgery, she would have dysphagia immediately. My concluding slide, ladies and gentlemen, would be Number one, establish your diagnosis of reflux, whether it be with endoscopy or your newer testing tools to assess which patients would benefit. And assess the esophageal motility carefully. Is the body functioning well? Is the door opening as per the Chicago classification? And I would encourage you all to always send a patient for a manometry study before surgery. And it's really key to avoiding post-surgery dysphagia and potentially a lawsuit. Professor Vimal, over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ruben, uh, for keeping the time. Uh, any questions from the panelists or the speakers? There's nothing on the chat box. Any questions? Hi, Asim. Sorry. Uh, Ruben, just one question. Uh, Ruben, sure. I understand that the definition or the number of refluxes, the percentage under pH 4 has changed in the recent Chicago classification. Is that right? Ah, okay, so Chicago looks at manometry. We're talking about the Leon and Porto consensus, I believe, for yes, reflux. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so that has changed a little bit. They've looked at normative values. Um, and what they've found is that in patients, they classify as pathological, less than 40, uh, sorry, more than 70 on impedance, uh, completely normal, less than 40. But there's now a recognition of a gray zone between 40 to 70. And we're talking about number of impedance events. And so that's where the gray zone lies. The acid exposure time hasn't markedly changed that much. But the idea is you then use the multi uh, parameters together to build up a story accordingly. Thank you. Yeah. Vimal, back to you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? If none, I think we should move on to the next talk. Maybe you can close your sharing. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I wish you all a good day as well. Thank you. Vimal, you want to do the introduction? Uh, I'm going to talk next. Okay.
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I was a bit late, uh, so I didn't know how it went. I was having some pro uh, problems with the connection. Uh, we carry on with the program and Dr. Vimal is up next. Dr. Vimal is a specialist surgeon practicing in Penang. He's one of the board of governors for uh, ELSA from Malaysia, and he's going to tell us how he does his uh, uh, hiatal hernia repairs and fund application. Over to you, Vimal. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I will move to the presentation. So these are my indications for surgery, uh, just as mentioned by Dr. Ruben. Uh, if you go down the list, uh, usually it's failed medical management, uh, those opt for surgery despite successful management, complications, and uh, those have, having extra individual manifestation. However, as I go down the list, actually, uh, I explain to the patient that the chances of success will actually reduce. Uh, these are the tests uh, done, uh, general preparation for general anesthesia. Stomach decompression is not routine, but uh, however, when I see inside, if the stomach has been overinflated by the anesthetist, I will ask to decompress. Antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, uh, I do give. Uh, patient is supine with leg split, French position, and uh, chest prepped and foot rest. So these are the equipment I use. Uh, basic uh, trocars, uh, re uh, disposable ones, uh, two 12 mm and three 5 millimeters. In the era of COVID, uh, I use uh, smoke filters, uh, scope is 10 by 30 degrees, then uh, ultrasonic dissectors and uh, regular laparoscopic hand instruments. Uh, so this is the position. Uh, I stand between the patient's legs. Uh, my patients don't look like this, so. Okay, so uh, the the first part of the surgery basically is the abdominalization of the esophagus. So uh, I will approach from the left side and uh, uh, mobilize uh, the angle, cardiovascular angle, and uh, try to delineate the uh, left crura. Okay. So this is the first part of my surgery. And then I go to the right side and approach from the past placida and the take down to expose the right crura. The pleuroperitoneal membrane is taken down. Then the right pleural dissection, and then putting a tape to control the cardiovascular junction. So once I have controlled that, then it's a question of uh, lengthening the esophagus, which you want to bring down intra-abdominally. So uh, we proceed to identify the uh, vagus anterior and posterior, and then uh, uh, bring down about uh, five centimeter of uh, esophagus. You need to be careful around the hiatus uh, because the pleura often dips down and uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, perforation of the the pleura, and uh, you need to warn your anesthetist uh, to watch out for any signs of uh, aerotrauma. So, if you're not sure, uh, just uh, take your time and look for the vagus. You do not want to injure the vagus nerve. Now, Bundle mobilization, I do not do it uh, regularly uh, due to the perceived uh, risk of uh, causing more bloating postoperatively. Uh, normally, after I've done the dissection, uh, I will try to pass the fundus through uh, posterior aspect of the esophagus. Uh, 
if I'm not able to do a good shoe shining maneuver, then I will proceed to uh, dissect a little bit of the uh, fundus uh, from the spleen. If I'm able to wrap properly, uh, because I'm doing a partial 270, then I will not uh, do this step. So it's an optional thing. So the shoe shining maneuver. So once you do the shoe shining maneuver and uh, leave the fundus and it doesn't go back inside, then you have enough. So the next step is uh, the chloroplasty. So uh, I used to use uh, braided uh, non-absorbable sutures. Uh, now I use uh, the barbed sutures. And uh, occasionally if the defect is large or uh, if the muscle uh, bulk of the sura is uh, less, then I will put pledges. If the defect is very large, then I may consider putting a mesh. Okay. Sorry, I have to run uh, through the video because I only have eight minutes to complete the procedure. So it's very important as you come close to the esophagus uh, to leave a, a, a lax area about about, uh, about a centimeter, not be too tight. Uh, some people often use bougies, uh, but uh, in my practice, I, I just eyeball. Okay. So that, that so we go to the esophagus and then come back. Next step is the fundal placation. Uh, a series of I, I use a non-absorbable braided two uh, O. Uh, three sutures on either side, okay, with one centimeter interval. Uh, you need a three cm uh, two seventy rep. Uh, anything less will uh, risk uh, uh, recurrence earlier. Okay, and the sutures are taken sub uh, a zero sub mucosal. So this last suture is a pexy to the crura to, to prevent the rap uh, migration. Okay, some people uh, do it uh, to two or three as parts of the crura. Okay, so similarly done on the other side of the fundus. Okay, last video. So, Then we remove the tape. Okay. And that's a wrap. Oh, Vima, are we coming to time? Yeah. So, uh, post op care is a standard, uh, just clear fluid post op. I'm in the prior practice, so I tend to go a bit slower, nourishing fluid for a few days and prepare for a week. I give DEXA for all the, uh, my upper GI cases for about a day to prevent nausea and vomiting and if the hospital working, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the hospital. That's all, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vimal, for that nice talk. Uh, we move on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Mark Smithers. Uh, he is the 
head of academics and uh, main chair of surgery uh, at the University of Queensland, Prince Alexandra Hospital. He is very well known across the globe for his work. His recent publication on the five years randomized control trial is a landmark, and he's going to speak up, uh, speak to us about the long-term outcomes uh, of re anti-reflux surgery and recurrent symptoms. Uh, over to you, Professor Mark Smith. Asim, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, uh, it's, I'm honoured to, to be able to speak to you all today. So I'm going to look at long-term outcomes from anti-reflux surgery. Remember, this is a Western population, so the uh, body habitus of a lot of these patients are going to be a little bit different to those people in Asia. And also I'll touch on outcomes for patients with recurrent symptoms. So we've already heard that there are a lot of symptoms that patients may have that may be attributed to reflux. Regurgitation is probably the only one we could be certain of, along potentially with heartburn, but there's a whole bunch of other symptoms that uh, reflux is blamed for, and we have to consider whether we'd help them with surgery. So what we're after is loss of the symptoms the patients have, and if they did have non-classic symptoms, they should be gone too. But we need to be aware that we will create new symptoms in this group of patients, not everybody, but in a significant number. Inability to belch, increased flatus, diarrhea, and I'll go through our broader list a little bit later on. We first published our, our initial series where we did preoperative and postoperative testing on every patient for 200 patients, and we reported at 12 months that laparoscopic approach was safe and the recurrence rate was low. Uh, this is data that's put together by my colleague, Les Nathanson and David Gottley, and all of our, all the data from the two units and two major hospitals in, in Brisbane has been put together to put together a larger series now of a lot of patients that have had surgery around the hiatus. We did uh, more intensive outcome studies up to 2008, and that's what I'll be reporting when I report the data. And our patient selection has been along the lines that has already been alluded to, patients with classic symptoms, or they have to have had clear evidence of reflux on testing if their symptoms weren't classic. The patients had to have had a trial of, of medical therapy and their quality of life had to be significantly impacted. And I'll touch on that as well. Our investigations, all patients have had an endoscopy we only do 24 hour pH studies selectively when we feel we need objective evidence to, to dis, dis, uh, diagnose it. And we do esophageal manometry uh, selectively and specifically in patients with dysphagia. The outcomes I'll be reporting will be the Demista symptom score, and I'll show you what I mean, the functional outcomes. We've done some specific objective testing looking at GI symptom rating, psychological well being, and then the patient's assessment. We've, I'm reporting prospective data collected between 1992 when we started in 2008. A research nurse has put all the patients on a Microsoft uh, database. We've sent out annual quality of life questionnaires and when patients haven't answered, we've tried to chase them up. We look at the functional outcome. Well, we've got baseline on a large number of patients with their Demista score and a large number for their quality of life assessments and then varying numbers up to 10 years. And we've got a small control group where we looked at patients without a GI disease and we tried to match them for age and sex. The Demista score, zero, one, two, and three. Zero and one, not much. Two moderate and three severe. And that's relevant to the curves I'm about or the bar graphs I'm going to show you. So this is our data for heartburn over five to 10 years where patients had a high incidence of heartburn, uh, moderate to severe, where you see it's low, but slightly increasing at the five to 10 year mark. We do, with the regurgitation and similar pictures where we see good control with some recurrence and a little bit more, the numbers aren't as high, but still significant numbers where with increasing time, the incidence recurs. Dysphagia is interesting a number of people will have a, an esophageal dysmotility from severe reflux and the dysphagia will improve. But remember, dysphagia is one of the symptoms we can cause from anti-reflux surgery. 
So these are the functional symptoms that are very relevant. This is our control group here, and you can see a large number of different symptoms, early satiety, colic, inability to vomit. All of these really are not too severe, but if you ask every patient, there'll be a degree. And the bottom line for the patient is, if you fix up their significant preoperative symptoms and you improve their quality of life, they can live with these symptoms. If you don't fix those preoperative symptoms and you give them these symptoms, they're not happy. But these are the sort of functional symptoms that can occur after this surgery. When we looked at our five-year results, 10% had recurrent heartburn, 5% regurgitation, 6% dysphagia, but that was better than what they were preoperatively. The early group that had had reoperations, we've essentially got rid of that. That was really in the first thousand cases where, where, where we are now much better and we, had, we were operating on patients for dysphagia and rap migration early on. So the reoperation rate really is the late reoperation rate at about five to 10 years is about 5%. Let's have a look at some of the objective assessment, uh, GI symptom rating scores. We looked at, at the GI symptom rating scale. This is 15 items and we get a score. This is the preoperative score. This is the 60 control group. And you can see there's a significant improvement that's long lasting in the objective assessment of their GI symptoms, but not quite to the level of normal. When we look at the psychological well-being of this subgroup of patients, when doing the psycho psychological well-being index, once more, preoperatively, this is the group, and there is a significant improvement right across the spectrum, particularly to five years, and it's similar to the control group. When we looked at quality of life, therefore, GI quality of life is improved and sustained, but not a normal population. And the psychological well-being index was improved, sustained, and level with the normal population. When we asked the patients, would you have this operation again? This is at 10 years, 88 to 89% said yes. So that means, and about 6% weren't sure, and four to 5% wish they hadn't had the surgery. So when we look at the assessment of outcomes, objectively the results are good, subjectively they're good. There's no specific objective measure, and, and including the psychological well-being index that will tell you the person in front of you is going to be satisfied. We've done a, so what we get from this data is there needs to be a lot of preoperative discussion before patients have their surgery. They should never be pushed into the operation. And what we've done with this operation and what I've done is I say to patients, you do not have cancer. You do not have to have an operation. You need to believe that your present state and the effect on your quality of life is bad enough to warrant surgery. Me as the surgeon, I should be your last resort. What fundoplication should we use? And there are four types in general. Nissen 360, 270, which you've seen, the partial anterior 180 and a partial 90. Our routine operation now is the toupee. And if we look at Nissen versus toupee, the two most common operations, there's a randomized trial with long-term data reported nearly 18 years ago that showed the Nissen had a bit more dysphagia at 10 years, a higher rap migration, more flatus and fullness, but equivalent reflux. If you look at our data, this is up to 2008 where we've got this objective data, and you'll see that we, net, we did very few extra Nissen after we did this analysis, and our routine operation became a toupee fundoplication. In a non-randomized fashion, we found that the two operations had equivalent reflux control at five and 10 years. At five years, there was equivalence in early satiety, bloat, nausea, diarrhea, but Nissen had a higher incidence of inability to vomit, difficulty to belch, and increased flatus. And our, long, our, our conclusions were equivalent reflux, equivalent quality of life, but toupee had slightly better functional sequelae than Nissen, and so that's our go-to operation. There's been one randomized trial that's looked at this out of Asia from China, small numbers showing equivalent re, uh, reflux control at one year, but functional problems a little worse with the Nissen. 
And then when you look at, at large meta-analyses, looking at multiple randomized trials with greater than five-year data, then once more, equivalent reflux control, but less wind-related symptoms from the posterior 270, the complications rates were the same. What about the anterior fundoplications? What about those? So that's the anterior partial, where you recreate the angle of hiss, and then you wrap 180 degrees, or the door 90 degree, which is my operation I do after an achalasia. There are a number of studies that have looked at anterior versus posterior. There's a met one meta-analysis with a large number. There's a 90 versus 360, 180 versus 360, 180 versus 270. The conclusions from all of this, the level one evidence would suggest that for reflux control and for incidence of functional symptoms, the posterior 270 or an anterior 180 partial fundoplication is supported over the Nissen. The long-term data for 180 is not as persuasive as the 270. What about revisional hiatus, uh, hiatal surgery? That was my other brief. So we looked at our early data. This is looking at one year outcome for a small number of patients. And our conclusion from this small study was that revisional surgery for recurrent reflux after a laparoscopic fundoplication uh, had a high incidence of succession patient satisfaction. And for those with dysphagia, we, we actually did make a difference. So we now consider revisional hiatal surgery when a patient develops new symptoms which have a major, and I stress, major impact on their quality of life. What symptoms might they have? They may have recurrence of classical reflux symptoms. Progressive dysphagia is more common. Uh, unusual reflux symptoms like pain, often postprandial. Some people get unusual left upper quadrant discomfort. I've had patients with pain, with swallowing and sweatiness. I can't explain that. Whether it's a vagal effect, I'm not sure and gas bloat. We investigate this group of people. I routinely do a barium swallow and meal. I'm looking for the anatomy of, of what's going on. If dysphagia is significant, then they would get a esophageal manometry and I would do a cine swallow with a solid phase. I do routine endoscopy. And for those selected patients once more, where they've got unusual symptoms and there's no clear objective evidence of reflux, they get a 24 hour pH study performed. So this is a patient with recurrent reflux and discomfort after eating. And you can see there's a small recurrent hiatus hernia. This is back in the days before the energy devices. Another small slip, a small hiatus hernia. This is not after a parasophageal hernia repair. This is after a, fundo, a straightforward fundoplication. This is the normal endoscopy after a, of one of my cases, after a fundoplication. And here you see what you see, the wrap is not quite as a valve that you saw before. And here's the hiatus and there's a small slip. And this can be very subtle. And people can have unusual symptoms, even with a small sip, slip. And sometimes with a barium study, it's not actually as clear. So the combination of the barium study and the endoscopy, and if you're not used to this on endoscopy, this is quite easy to miss. And that's quite, that's much more common. And this is a much, this is a, a small rolling hernia where some of the fundus is rolled up and much easier to see at endoscopy. And you see the loss of that valve on retroflexion. And then this is going in and there's a, this is a rolling hernia, a recurrent hernia, this is the esophagogastric junction, stomach lumen, and this is uh, the hernia. So when we've operated on, we've operated now with data, uh, we're on, we've operated a lot more patients, but with data of over 400 patients, most had recurrent reflux, many had dysphagia, some glass, gas bloat, some had a, a hiatus hernia, but a combination of these things, and, and about 7% had very unusual symptoms with an anatomical problem seen at endoscopy or on the barium study. If you look at that series, 
Uh, about 6% we, we, uh, needed to be converted from a laparoscopic fundoplication, 5% uh, after a laparoscopic repair previously, and more patients uh, if they'd had a previous open repair. The pathology we found at the time of surgery, about a third had a recurrent hiatus hernia, wrap disruption or migration occurred in, in about 28%. The wrap was intact with symptoms in a quarter of the patients and, un, un, and loose or tight hiatus otherwise. The aim for us is to repair the hiatus and restore the fundoplication. We routinely take down the whole fund, previous fundoplication and repair the hiatus. And we would, and there are things we might do if there's a shortened hiatus. We sh this is our data preoperatively and we see when you look at the incidence of heartburn, we have a, at five years, the incidence is slightly higher than after the first time fundoplication incidence. And then for regurgitation, we've got good control at five years with revisional surgery. And if we look at dysphagia, there's a subgroup of patients that will have dysphagia at five years. Professor Mark, we've got to rush up a little bit. Okay. Uh, so. Revision, they don't do as well as for with primary surgery. I won't go through, these were some tips. Uh, if you're the third time in, it's much harder and you may need to have some other tricks such as a collis gastroplasty or a revert to a ruan Y bypass. So for anti-reflux surgery, re, uh, reflux control is good, patient selection is important. Functional sequelae can occur after all operations. Patients need to be warned about this. A partial 270, I think, is a good standard operation. A 180 is an alternative. Revisional surgery is very difficult and you need to be experienced and patients need to be counseled appropriately. And this is the time-lapse photography of the three of us who've uh, been working together all these years doing this surgery. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll leave the questions to the end. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Smithers. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Professor John Lippens. Professor John Lippens is a professor of clinical surgery and chief of uh, the upper GI surgery and director for the Four Gut Cancer Program at the University of Southern California, uh, an affiliated academic uh, place of practice at the Hogue Memorial Hospital. He's going to talk to us about uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation from concept to present. Uh, over to you, sir. All right, thank you, Seem, and thank you for having me and uh, allowing me to speak with this uh, distinguished group. Um, I'm gonna go, go kind of quickly here to make sure I kind of run on time because I do have a fair amount in here, but first and foremost, the disclosures, no presentation is good without a good set of disclosures. The relevant one here, actually two of them, is that I'm a consultant for Ethicon, which makes the magnetic sphincter augmentation device. Uh, the other disclosure that's probably more relevant is I am about as inbred Tom Demeester as you can get. Uh, I was his intern, his resident, his fellow, his junior partner slash super fellow for about 10 or 15 years before he retired. And so, my view of the world uh, at best is skewed. Uh, some would say for the better, others would say for the worse. Uh, I'm gonna let you decide on that one. My objectives here really today is kind of just walk you down the path that I've been. Uh, it's been a very strange, weird path, um, looking at the evolution of GERD treatment. I'm kind of gonna go over why uh, people, uh, Tom Demeester specifically, thought we needed a new treatment for reflux. I'm also going to go over who this treatment should be for and then fast forward to where we are today in regards to uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation. So basically I'm going to give you the 15 year journey that I've been on with links or magnetic sphincter augmentation. I'm going to try to provide data to support uh, its use uh, as you will soon see in most if not all GERD patients. And so the current management of reflux, I don't need to go over it again. I think we've seen just about everything we need to see and it's pretty simple and it's been pretty simple for the last 30, 50 years. Um, it's a situation where it's very similar to if you go to a barber, you're gonna get a haircut. Meaning if you've got reflux and you end up in a gastroenterologist's office, by God, you are gonna get treated with medications. Um, and I can tell you that for the longest time, we all thought the medications were very effective in treating this disease. 
In fact, 99% effective in treating reflux. In fact, back then we actually thought that the PPIs and the H2 blockers would halt the progression of the disease. If you had reflux, you just needed to go on Prilosec or Nexium, and you had no worries after that because it would halt the progression. We also thought the medications were safe. Um, now, on the flip side of this, if mistakenly Google Maps was wrong and somehow you ended up in a surgeon's office, by God, you were going to get surgery, at least at USC where you were, because we knew in our hearts this was the greatest operation on earth. The Nissen fund application was 99% effective in treating reflux. In fact, Tom Demeester himself would tell you that every patient with reflux, and many without, needed a Nissen fund application. You walk through the doors of our hospital, and by God, you were going to get a Nissen fund application, and you would be better off for it. We also thought that it would halt the progression of the disease. If you had reflux, if you had Barrett's, you just needed a Nissen, and it would stop it in its tracks. We also thought the operation was safe. And I can tell you, in, in expert hands, in Tom Demeester's hands, in Professor Smithers' hands, it is a safe operation. Now, as it turns out, though, that's not where a lot of these operations are occurring. It's not necessarily in expert hands. The medications, as we've learned over this last probably 10 or 15 years, aren't 99% effective. In fact, what it really boils down to, as was pointed out earlier by John Pandolfino's video, is the regurgitative symptoms. This is where the medications really fail. There's also been long-term safety concerns with the medications, and I don't obviously have time to go over the pluses or minuses in the data that support or deny that safety concerns. And there's also been issues with whether or not the medications actually halt the progression. Are patients sort of immune to developing esophageal cancer if they're on a PPI? Now the surgery, as I've learned over these last probably 15 years, is a little bit fraught with issues. Uh, Professor Smithers has gone over a lot of those right now. Um, and I could probably spend another hour going over some of the data in regards to Nissen fund application. But suffice it to say, there has been safety concerns. And again, I'd like to point out that it's not necessarily in expert hands, but I can tell you, at least here in the United States, the bulk of anti-reflux surgery isn't done in expert hands. It's done at the community hospital, many times by surgeons that do one or two of these a week. So because of this, there have been safety issues. There's been durability questions about how long the procedure lasts. I can tell you there's huge variations in how this procedure is done, as well as the outcomes of the procedure. There's also this question of applicability to the GERD population. I can tell you as a surgeon, I sit down with a patient and I think I, I really try to minimize it. I tell them, well, I'm going to do it through little bitty incisions. It's going to take me about an hour. You're going to go home the next day. It's not a big deal. But we are taking down the short gastric vessels most of the time, or at least in my hands we are. We're wrapping the stomach around the end of the esophagus. We're permanently sewing it there. We are altering the anatomy. And so it may be a little overkill for a treatment for heartburn. And then there's the question of side effects. Professor Smithers has been over this uh, in great detail, but the side effects to the patients are real. And the most of the side effects, as was pointed out, are with Nissen fund application, but unfortunately, the partial fund applications have been sort of guilty by association. And so the why as to why we needed another treatment really boiled down to the reputation of Nissen fund application. And whether you want to believe it or not, and like I said, in expert hands, it probably isn't the case. But nowadays, with the power of Dr. Google, perception is reality. And I can tell you it's become harder and harder to talk a patient into having any sort of fund application. Because after being in their visit with Dr. Google, they know for a fact that if they have the operation done, they're going to have to have it redone in 10 years because it's going to fail. You're not going to be able to vomit if you have this operation done. 40% of the patients are still going to have to take their proton pump inhibitors. They're going to be bloated to beat the band, and they're going to be able to fly their self to the moon with the flatulence that's created by the operation. So again, not the experience that we've had here at USC, but I can tell you this is the perception of the patient. And this has been the biggest obstacle to getting patients in for surgical treatment for reflux. 
And so about 15 years ago, and here's where my involvement started with this, two engineers from a small startup company from Minnesota came out to meet with Tom Demeester and myself. Well, obviously they didn't come out to meet with me, but I was there, I got him coffee. And you can imagine as I'm sitting in the back of his office, ironing his lab coat, I hear them talking about potentially putting magnets around the esophagus. And at that moment in time, I've known Tom Demeester long enough that I know either one of two things are gonna happen. He's either gonna fall asleep right then and there, or he's gonna kick him out of their office. I look over and I kid you not, he's sitting there and he's awake, he's scratching his chin and he's just thinking this is the greatest idea on earth to put magnets around the esophagus. The idea being the force of attraction will keep that lower esophageal sphincter closed to prevent reflux. Now what's going through my mind at that point is before I see that happening, I think I'm gonna see pigs fly. That's what I think. There's no way on earth we're gonna be putting magnets around somebody's esophagus to treat reflux. This has gotta be the most ridiculous idea I have ever heard. And so I said, Tom, how does this make sense? How are we gonna, why are we gonna put magnets around somebody's esophagus? We already got, we got a surgery for that. We don't need to bring in magnets to do this. He said, John, John, just you watch and you wait and you see. And so we started in pigs. So 15 years ago, there we go. We're gonna put these in pigs. Now, not that you can do a GERD HRQL score in pigs, but we were looking at the feasibility and safety of the procedure. The idea was we would place the device around the end of the esophagus. We would not disrupt any of the anatomy. Um, in fact, we would do this probably in patients without significant hernias. And so we wouldn't even have to monkey with the cura of the diaphragm. The idea was the force of attraction would keep that weak valve closed, but the force of a swallow or the force of belching and vomiting would cause those beads to spread apart so patients could do all that naturally. And I said to Dr. Meeser, I said, well, Ed, you know, that sounds great, but to me that just sounds like a magnetic Nissen. You know, all we're doing is we're trading a free tissue repair for a $5,000 bling magnet. It just doesn't seem to make sense. And he said, no, 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 John, that's, that's not the case. These things are, these things are very different. Like, well, how are these two things different? He's all, well, you see, a Nissen fundoplication really creates a new one-way valve. And I'm like, what? I'm like, for 20 years, you've been telling me that wrapping the stomach around the end of the esophagus was going to tighten up that weak valve there, um, and that's why we were doing it. No, no, that's not what I meant. What I meant was it's creating its own new nipple valve. And if you look at it endoscopically, as Professor Smithers pointed out, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a funnel or nipple valve created by that wrapping or invagination process around the esophagus. The links, on the other hand, truly was meant to augment that weak valve. If you look at the operative video, which I think Asim is going to show, you'll see that it doesn't pinch the esophagus closed. What it's doing is preventing opening of the GE junction. So it's increasing yield pressure. The Nissen funnel location obviously disrupts native anatomy. Um, we're going in there, we're taking the short gastrics down, we're wrapping the stomach around. The lynx, on the other hand, was meant to preserve the anatomy. The Nissen, in my mind, is not really physiologic. Some reflux is normal. Everybody has some degree of reflux, but we are taking patients with an abnormally high amount of reflux and bringing them to an abnormally low amount of reflux. If you do pH testing on a post-Nissen patient, especially in that first year, they're going to have close to zero episodes of reflux, and that's not normal. The Lynx was designed to be more physiologic, to allow for belching, to allow for vomiting. The Nissen also is sort of quote unquote irreversible. We as surgeons, we can go in there and loosen it, but it never truly returns patients to the way they were. The Lynx, on the other hand, was designed to be reversible. Because we haven't disrupted the anatomy, we can go in there and we can take it out. And so at the end of the day, the way it was described to me was that it, the Nissen was effective, but it was bigger surgery and it came with a cost, that cost being a side effect profile. The hope with Lynx was that it would be effective, but without the problems associated with Nissen fund application. Well, I can tell you this, I went kicking and screaming down this pathway and was probably the biggest skeptic. And my biggest question was, well, who would this work for? And the thought back then was that this was a treatment for very mild reflux patients. In fact, that's how we started. We started simple, that patient with mild reflux, that low-hanging fruit or mythical GERD patient, the ones that don't have a hiatal hernia, they don't have esophagitis, they have no Barrett's, they have normal motility, and they're actually pretty well controlled on their PPIs. 
But this is the group of patients that we started with. And in retrospect, I think it pigeonholed us into believing that this was a treatment only for mild reflux. Well, despite this, all of this, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism, not just by myself, but pretty much the entire surgical community, that this wouldn't work, this wouldn't control reflux. And most of us are old enough, at least on this panel, to remember angel, chick, and lap band, and there were significant concerns over the erosion risk of the device. Well, like I said, I was pretty skeptical going down this pathway. In fact, I was made to go down this pathway, and it wasn't until about the, until the five-year results started to come back that I actually started to believe that this may be a viable treatment for reflux. The five-year results from the clinical trials were ultimately published, ironically, in a GI journal in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology. And not only were they published in a GI journal, but they made the cover of the journal. And the reason it made the cover is because the results were so good. The clinical trial enrolled 100 patients at baseline. These are symptom scores from heartburn to regurgitation to need for PPI and dissatisfaction. And as you can see, the patients were fairly symptomatic. And now with nearly 100 patients out to five years, we saw resolution in their reflux symptoms. And more importantly, we didn't see deterioration in results. Now, again, I was skeptical, so I needed to see pH data. Now, the two initial clinical trials uh, had pH data ranging anywhere from one to four years out. Italy's single center experience had pH data ranging out to six years. And what you're seeing here on the screen is these were fairly symptomatic patients represented in dark blue are their preoperative pH tests with percent time pH less than four ranging anywhere from six to 12%. And now with follow-up out to six years, what we've seen is normalization of pH parameters, upwards of around 90% pH normalization. And the reason it's normalizing the pH is illustrated here on these two endoscopic pictures. The top picture is preoperatively, and you can see that's a pretty patchulist valve on retroflex view. We would grade that as at least a grade or hill grade three valve. The picture on the bottom is post-op links. Um, and as you can see, it's now returned that area to what most would consider a normal appearing hill grade one valve. Now, despite that uh, data uh, and pH data and five-year results, uh, people still were quite skeptical uh, on the procedure. Uh, they wanted to see a randomized controlled trial. John Pandolfino on the opening video alluded to it, but a randomized controlled trial was recently completed comparing links to PPIs in regards to regurgitative symptoms. If you're not familiar with this study, it was a two to one randomization. 50 patients were randomized to links. 100 patients were randomized to BID PPI. They were all pH positive. They all had typical reflux symptoms in addition to regurgitative symptoms. Patients were asked to come back at six months for normal symptom questionnaires as well as impedance pH testing. What we found here was that the patients that were randomized to links, um, over or almost 90% of them had complete elimination of their regurgitative symptoms, where it was only about 10% of the patients that were randomized to BID PPI. GERD HRQL scores were significantly better in the links arm, and 92% of patients were able to stop all their antacid medications when randomized to links. What was more important to me was the results of the impedance pH testing. Here, what we saw across the board was approximately 90% pH normalization. Whether you were classifying that as number of episodes of reflux, Demetra score, or percent time pH less than four, 90% of the patients were now normalized. So a randomized controlled trial showing superiority over PPIs in regards to regurgitative symptoms, as well as normalization of pH parameters. And so the next question along this pathway was, well, that's well and good, but my Nissen's pretty good too. Is it any better than my Nissen? Well, Luigi Bonavina out of Italy recently published a meta-analysis comparing links to Nissen fund application. Follow-up was anywhere from six to 12 months. There were 1,200 patients in the study. About seven of them, 700 of them got links, a little over 500 of them got fund application. And what he found was the two, uh, two surgeries were very equal as far as symptom relief, as well as PPI elimination rates. They had similar dysphagia rates, mild dysphagia rates, but where Lynx really had an advantage was in the side effect profile. Lynx had significantly less gas and bloating and a much higher likelihood of being able to belch uh, as well as vomit. 
The other thing that was interesting about Luigi's study here was that, and it didn't meet statistical significance, but there was a trend towards a 50% higher reoperation rate with Nissen fund application. So again, showing that the links seem to have a significant advantage as far as the side effect profile, but was equal in efficacy. And so that was kind of the end of the preliminary data is the way I see it in this sort of early mild reflux patient. And so the next question down this pathway was, well, you know, I really don't see those patients. Those aren't the patients that really need surgery. The patients that need surgery are the ones with the hiatal hernias. These are really the bulk of the unhappy GERD patients. These are the patients that are having more regurgitative symptoms that are difficult to control. These are the patients that I think are at a higher risk for progression of their Barrett's. And so our thought at this time, which was about five, six years ago, was, well, what if we go ahead and go in there and fix the hiatal hernia and then go ahead and place the device? meaning it gets to this idea that it's really a two-sphincter hypothesis, and I don't have time to go through all the data on that, but it turns out that the barrier to reflux is really both the lower esophageal sphincter as well as the integrity of the cura, meaning not having a hiatal hernia. So our idea was we'd restore the first barrier, the integrity of the cura, fix that hernia, and then we should be able to use the links. So about five years ago, we strayed from the reservation we decided to go big or go home, and we started to do it in patients with the bigger hernias. And it didn't matter whether it was a five centimeter hernia, seven centimeter, or whole stomach in the chest. Our thought was if we fix that hernia, we could do anything we wanted to that lower esophageal sphincter, and it should stop reflux. The technique, I don't really need to go over this, it's the same technique we use for Nissen fund application. Part one of the surgery, and I would argue that these are really two surgeries, the first surgery is to fix the hernia which is what we always do. We go in there, reduce the hernia, reduce the sac, mobilize the esophagus, get plenty of intra-abdominal length, and close the cura. Part two is to fix the lower esophageal sphincter. So in this time, instead of wrapping the fundus of the stomach around the esophagus, we're just gonna wrap the links. We published the results of this uh, about four years ago now in patients with hernia size up to three centimeters, uh, or, sorry, up to seven centimeters in size. Um, Follow-up was a median of about 12 months, uh, and we compared this group of patients with the bigger hernias to the group we did in the clinical trials with the small, little, itty-bitty, non-existent hernias. Should be no surprise, the patients with the bigger hernias are a more severe reflux group, longer durations of reflux, higher pH scores, more esophagitis, and a trend towards more Barrett's. What was surprising was this. We actually saw better results in the patients with the bigger hernias and worse reflux when we went in there and fixed the hernia and put the links in. Part of the reason is because in the early days, we did not fix the little bitty hernias, we only put the links in. So here what we were seeing was 90% PPI elimination rates, symptom improvement better than in the patients with the little bitty hernias, GERD HRQL scores were significantly better um, in the patients with the bigger hernias, and the incidence of mild dysphagia was the same between the two groups. And so what this did is to me, it opened the door. It opened the door for most GERD patients. And so this opened the door for us doing patients with Barrett's. We published this a couple of years ago. We were looked at the first 67 patients we had done with Barrett's esophagus. We broke it up into ultra short segment, short segment and long segment. I don't have time to go through all the details of this, but the bottom line is it did work in these patients. We saw pH, uh, pH normalization rates of around 85%. We brought patients from a Demetra score of 35 now down to nine. And we also saw Barrett's regression and fairly significant Barrett's regression, more so than what we saw with Nissen fund application. In fact, upwards of around 70% regression of short segment Barrett's uh, after links. Even when we looked at patients that had had more than one endoscopy, meaning they were two, three years out, um, they still were having 70% uh, regression of their Barrett's. And so despite all that, there's still extreme skepticism. And the skepticism is because of a lack of long-term data. Well, long-term data was just published about two weeks ago by Luigi Bonavina's group, looking at six to 12 year results with links. And again, don't have time to go through the entire manuscript, but the median follow-up within this uh, publication was nine years. So 124 patients with a median follow-up of nine years. 
What he found in here was that GERD HRQL scores went from almost 20 down to four. Percent time pH less than four went from almost 10% down to 4% with about 80% pH normalization at the 10 year mark. Um, there was 93% patient satisfaction. Patients with regurgitative symptoms or about 60% of them with regurgitative symptoms and that went down to a cohort of about 9.6%. Almost 80% of the patients were off all their PPIs. The hiatal hernia recurrence rate was lower than what we traditionally see with Nissen fund application at about 6.5%. The safety has also been extensively studied. Again, don't have time to go through all of it, but the two key safety issues to me were the need for removal and erosion risk. This has been published several times. The explant rate seems to be around 2.7% at long-term follow-up. And the erosion rate compared to an angel chick or lap band, which had an erosion rate of 2 to 3%, the erosion rate with link seems to be around 0.5 to 0.3%. When it's eroded, all we needed to do was take the device out, the area healed, patients have not needed esophagectomy or gastrectomy. And so that's really all I've got. We started with a procedure that I thought was amenable only to pigs, and it has somehow evolved to what now I would see as first-line surgical therapy um, for any patient with reflux. So at our institution, anybody that comes in, gets the normal workup that wants to get off their PPIs, and if they're a candidate for a fund application, specifically Nissen fund application, they're automatically also a candidate for links. There's really not much that separates those two. The only thing that would deter a patient off this pathway uh, is poor esophageal motility, and then I agree those patients will get a partial fund application in my hands. So anyway, I will stop there, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, okay. Uh, I think. Can I introduce you, Samir? Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Ashim. Uh, Shabir from uh, NUS uh, Singapore. Uh, he's well known to all of us in Asia. He's a very uh, ardent uh, teacher. Uh, he will be talking on magnetic sphincter augmentation for GERD in Asia. Over to you, Ashim. Thank you very much. Um, let me just go through. I hope. Uh, okay, slideshow. Well, thank you very much for joining the ELSA meeting, MIS in Era of Disruption. And thank you for joining the session. Thank you for the previous speakers. I would just share our little experience uh, in uh, Singapore, which represents Asia at this point in time. I know Hong Kong is the only other center which has done a few cases of mag magnetic sphincter augmentation. So I'm currently a consultant for Johnson & Johnson for the links. That's my disclosures. So we started training uh, some way back in June 2019. Uh, John's been our mentor and has uh, not only taken us through the procedures, but has been of great uh, help in terms of managing patients and post-op expectations. Uh, we did our initial follow-up six months down at December 2019, which is where some of the data comes back. As of June 2020, we have done about 16 cases uh, and we, we are now back to where we uh, back on track and we're doing more and more of these. Uh, our median hospital stay to begin with was 3.3 days. Now they get the operation the day and the next day after they can tolerate a normal diet, uh, which is one of the great advantages of this procedure. Patients don't have to be on a liquid diet for six weeks. Uh, they head off uh, home. Uh, depending upon how they experience, uh, generally about two to six days of stay uh, is the norm that we experience. Uh, I would like to, since we don't have a very big series, I'd like to share some experiences from across Asia and I'll discuss three cases in context of presentation for GERD. I'll talk about the first case, which is that of a heartburn, the second case, which is of a regurgitation, and the third, which is of a uh, sleeve gastrectomy. So the first case <coughs> is a Euro-Asian gentleman uh, who's been having uh, regurgitation, but more of heartburns for almost about two odd years. Uh, this is the endoscopy. You can see an LA grade A esophagitis, a small hiatus hernia, uh, takes PPI intermittently, but in terms of quality of life, is not able to go out to drinking uh, and uh, other things and doesn't want to be on PPI for a long time, but this is responsive to PPI. So this is a pre-linked uh, high resolution manometry and pH data. And you can see that overall, 
uh, his uh, number of peristalsis, which is the motility, is normal. Uh, his acid exposure is 7.4%, which by any criteria is indicative of refluxes, and he gets about 104 refluxes over uh, 24 hours. Uh, on the twin, in June, we implanted uh, 15 bead uh, links. Uh, we, the, the, uh, as uh, John just mentioned, the good thing is you can standardize the procedure. You can have the procedure happening recurrently at, with the same standardization because there is a sizer that is there to measure and you generally size two up. So the patient got a 15 bead device. So after the procedure, six months, we repeated the pH and impedance on this patient. And you can see uh, that the peristalsis, which were largely, some of them were abnormal to start with, are actually now normal. Uh, so the motility has improved. The acid exposure time has come down to normal. And so have the refluxes come down to within normal range. So uh, this includes the GERD score. So regurgitation score was 16 to start off with, and at six months, comes down to zero. And the total score, this includes the GERD score over time as well. Post links, they, they feel a little bit of dysphagia. That's why you get this uh, slightly higher uh, score here. Uh, that's for quality of life. But after that, they kind of settle down with their new lifestyle. So it did make a difference, at least at six months. I followed this guy up to one year now, and he's doing uh, perfectly well without any symptoms. This is a gentleman uh, with no previous medical history. Uh, again, since young, uh, since the time he knows he's actually been regurgitating his food, uh, never had the opportunity of not knowing what a normal uh, meal would be like with minimal heartburn, um, taking PPI, uh, but just intermittently just to change the taste of what comes back because it was acidic. But no, as you see on the endoscopy, there's really no esophagitis uh, at the end uh, of the gastroesophageal junction. Mm -hmm. uh, motility, peristalsis, normal exposure time again raised, and uh, so were the number of refluxes. Uh, he was implanted a 15 bead device again in June, and this is uh, after six months. Uh, his peristalsis a little bit not so, uh, a little bit decreased from what you see initially, and this is something we're trying to study at this point in time. Why do they change, and why did they change for worse or for better? Acid exposure time goes down to normal. His refluxes are back with the normal. He enjoys the same quality of life, uh, which he doesn't remember actually having. And he is so much glad uh, that he does not regurgitate his food any more longer. Uh, I followed him for a year, still under follow-up, and he's actually doing very well. You can see regurgitation heartburn scores very high and down at six months and even at one year, he continues to maintain that. That one score in the total score includes the good quality of life. Um, when you put a links device in, they need to learn to eat slowly. If not, uh, they feel a bit choked and sometimes they might vomit. So there is certainly a change in the, in the way they are required to eat for allowing peristalsis to, uh, ex to move the food downstream. Now, the last but not the least is uh, another Indian gentleman. He basically had left severe track me done by me in 2013 for super obesity post uh, surgery. He developed severe heartburn and regurgitation. Uh, and you can see here at a grade four esophagitis, which is really bad. It's really affecting his uh, quality of life. He can't, he's allergic to the proton pump inhibitors. So goes on to famotidine. So peristalsis, good within the normal range, about 70% of them uh, are effective and normal. Acid exposure, he couldn't tolerate uh, what was inserted there. So we couldn't get, uh, there was some technical uh, issue here with HRM, which uh, uh, if Ruben was around would have explained, but the catheters are manufacturer specific and you need to recalibrate the machine according to the uh, vendor's uh, calibration. And he had the wrong calibration. And so these reasons, it, will, it was void. Uh, we uh, used the same size as we measured standard because the esophagus was animated. So we put a 16 bead sizer in him. And you can see his heartburn scores were 25 and 20. And at two weeks post, he actually had complete remission of his symptoms. One year post links, he has some degree of heartburn and regurgitation, which if we look at the endoscopy, you can see a very good healing from an LA grade CD esophagitis all the way down. 
uh, he feels much better, but I think due to peristalsis issues, which make it difficult to clear, and there's some pooling of uh, the gastric juices that do come back a little bit. He has a pH time of 9% at the moment, so not completely normal again, uh, learning from what John has said and what Professor Mark Smithers has said, that you, it's not always an expectation to be normal. Uh, but you get much more better in what you're having. And here, he does have some degree of supragastric belching because of the nature of uh, the procedure itself. He has number of refluxes at 191 still, and uh, we put him on proton pump inhibitor, uh, about 20 milligrams every, sorry, on famotidine, and he is doing actually well without any symptoms at the moment. Uh, I would just like to share a short video, and the hiatal hernia repair has been done. Uh, you just pick up the vagus nerve. Once you're through the vagus, uh, you create a retroesophageal tunnel between there and the vagus, so that would allow the device to stay in place. This is a post-sleeve patient. Okay. So you exchange the Penrose drain there so that the vagus is now posterior. Uh, this is the sizer that we were talking about. And it will squeeze on and where the thing snaps uh, on the handle of it, it will correspond to the number of beads that needs to be used to deploy the device. After that, uh, we measure it three times and then take an average of that. And then this is the Lynx device that is deployed about two to three centimeters above the gastroesophageal junction. There is a buckle, you fasten the buckle, it will lock itself. Once the grooves are invisible, the device is in place, uh, you pull and check. And pretty much uh, done with it. Take out those sutures that are there for the device. Thank you. So uh, in, general con in general conclusion, um, we basically have had very good outcomes with our primary patients who've had primary reflux problems like heartburn, regurgitation, and even their um, non-GI uh, related symptoms get much better. The sleeve we are still learning from, uh, and I think the whole global experience will bring to it uh, more valuable input, which we will ultimately learn how to size and manage this device properly. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind attention. Thank you, Asim, for the nice presentation. I think we should go on to the question and answer session, right? Yes, please. So uh, I think we've got one uh, question. Uh, I will address this to both, uh, all three of you. Uh, this is from Gopal who says, what do you do when you find that you've accidentally damaged the vagal trunk? So I guess uh, mm -hmm. we start with Vimal there. We go to uh, Professor Mark Smithers and then Professor John there. Uh, Vimal. Your take on uh, well, the, To me, the best uh, way is uh, to prevent. We have to look for the vagus at all costs, uh, usually the anterior first and then the posterior. If you're not sure, don't cut any structures. Uh, I think that's the way I will go about it. Prevention. Okay. Professor Marks, do you have any comments? On that? Uh, so I'm very careful to identify both vagal nerves. I typically include the, the posterior vagus in my wrap. Um, uh, if you damage it, it's damaged. Uh, I think the vagus nerve is at a much higher risk in revisional surgery, much higher. You should not really damage it in first time surgery just by being careful. So I agree avoidance is the, is the important thing. So why, why do you say that the recurrence rates are higher in terms why do you think so? You know, I, the, the potential to damage the vagus nerve is higher if you're doing revisional higher. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
John, from a Lynx point of view, do you have any input if the Vegas gets injured? What would you do then? Well, I mean, I agree. I think the first, the first and most important message is, you know, make sure you can identify the Vegas nerves. Don't cut anything. Uh, I think prevention is your best measure. Having said that, if you're at a facility like mine that has residents and fellows, these things uh, happen. And when it does happen, if we can't put it between the posterior vagus and esophagus, uh, we need something to hold it in place long enough while it sort of encapsulates or scars in. The purpose of putting it between the posterior vagus is to prevent migration of that lynx. Um, the anterior vagus doesn't work very well. It, it splays out early. It's more adherent. And so we prefer to take a very absorbable suture like a chromic or maybe vicryl, put it into the muscle and wrap it around one of the wires to hold the links there while it encapsulates. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'll just start with you for the second question, and that's about how tight do you close your hiatus? And then we'll go back the other way. Um, well, I, admittedly, I, I close it pretty tight. And again, that was a demesterism. He would use the bougie to fashion his wrap. We'd close the cura, put the bougie down, fashion the wrap, then he'd take the bougie out and then he'd put one more stitch in the cura. So he'd make it pretty tight. There was no daylight around the esophagus at rest. And so that's pretty much how I've continued on. And especially with links where we want it pretty snug to prevent early migration or reherniation, um, I do close it pretty snug. Not pinching, but without daylight. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mark Smith. Is. Well, I'm the opposite. So I, I ensure that there's some gap between the hiatus, particularly in the front. So I'll do the sutures behind and then I'll explore the front. And I'd like to be able to get an inch, have a half a centimetre between the anterior hiatus and the esophagus. And I use a 50 bougie routinely. So I, I've always worried about uh, obstruction at the level of the hiatus. I think most of it settles down after the initial dysphagia when you get some reduction in the swelling. I also do a, a suture between the hiatus and the esophagus to try to close the gap to try to reduce parasophageal herniation. And, and we haven't got good data, but my anecdotal experience is in the latter half of, my, of our experience, we had less recurrent hernias uh, once we started doing that. And I think that, that one of the reasons for that was we routinely mobilised the fundus, as you would mentioned, John, that we, I, I always take down short gastrics and have always done so. Thank you. Uh, there is a question about any problems for MRI after a Lynx procedure. Yes, there is. Uh, you can use about 1.5 Tesla for the current available devices. Anything beyond that will inactivate the magnets. It will not pull the device out. That's the, at least the experience that's been globally shared. So uh, precautions come after 1.5 Tesla. Uh, John, we have a question from you. Why has there been no RCT comparing Lynx with partial fundoplication? Is Lynx a better option for the less experienced surgeon? No, I, I, I would argue that, uh, the, you know, no option is a good option for the less experienced surgeon. I think that's part of the reason we got into trouble with the reputation of this and fundoplication, at least here in the United States, uh, because pretty much anybody and their brother-in-law could do the procedure. Um, why there hasn't been a randomized controlled trial? We tried very early on to do a randomized controlled trial, but you know, even here in the United States, even in Southern California, we couldn't find patients dumb enough to either randomize to a new implant procedure or fund application, which here in the States has a pretty bad reputation. So we couldn't enroll it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question and uh, we'll pass this to Vimal. What procedure would you offer a patient with 100% failed peristalsis on manometry? Would you offer this patient a fund application at all? Uh, no. Uh, well, come. <laughs> does the rest of the panel have any differing op opinions on this? Yeah. Um, so we, in a patient with dysphagia and we do motility, if they have a hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, in other words, they don't have achalasia and distorted peristalsis or very low peristalsis, I do a, a um, toupee. I, you know, I think there'd be a, a greater case to consider an anterior fundoplication. The patient with scleroderma, on the other hand, I would do a, a, with severe reflux, I'd do a 90 degree 
fundoplication. I, I really, that's a subgroup that very, very difficult to manage. But just somebody who walks in off the street, hypotensive sphincter, distorted peristalsis, our experience has been a toupee has been okay. John? Yeah, I, I agree with Mark on that. The only thing, the only caveat is in the scleroderma patients. Um, we also talked to them about gastric bypass. We've had pretty good experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point, John. Very good point. I think, you know, the, the real worry about that subset is that they have gastric dysmotility as well. And that uh, you're more likely to deal with their acid and their bile reflux with a, with a gastric bypass. So I think that's an excellent point. So we, we've got a question for about whether is it going to be one of the first lines of surgery for patients for reflux in Singapore? Well, we're exploring to see how it goes. Uh, and we've looked at the worldwide data. So we're trying to now create Asian data to see how the Asians are responding to the implantation of uh, the Lynx device. And until we have that data, uh, mm -hmm. we will continue to pitch on at the moment. Uh, Can I ask John a question? Yes, please. Do your insurers cover the cost of the Lynx, John? You know, that's been our biggest hurdle here in the States. That's a great question. Um, you know, you would think that here in the States, FDA approval would equate to insurance coverage, but the two aren't related at all. And so the biggest struggle we've had is getting insurance coverage. So it's probably only about 20% of insurances will cover it right now. Um, the other 80%, we have to take them to court, appeal, um, and we may win another 20%. Uh, Are they so in Singapore, I think? Yeah. Insurance cover, this link? Uh, no. Uh, so, but our uh, the um, government there is a government subsidy for it. So the out of pocket claim for the device is not that much. So it's still reasonable, and patients can pay for it from that. So thank you very much. I think um, uh, I, I think the rest of the questions have pretty much uh, been dealt with during the presentation. Uh, we will need to conclude the session uh, because uh, we need to go on to the auditorium now. So I would like to thank all, uh, I'd like to thank Vimal and all the speakers, Professor Mark Smithers and John Lippem as well. Thank you very much. Uh, both of you are towards midst of days. Uh, he's going to begin and end his day. So thank you indeed. Thank you for taking your time and sharing with us. Really appreciate it. Thank that. you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure. Pleasure.